Hi, welcome to the Blueprint Leadership Podcast. I'm Kay Wright, your 18th Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. And I want to say thanks to everyone for joining us today. Uh, my guest today is someone that I've really been looking forward to speaking to, someone that I've worked with over the past uh, two to three years, I think, since I've been the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. She is the 16th uh, Command Chief Master Sergeant of the Office of Special Investigations, better known as Air Force OSI. And uh, it's an honor. It's an honor to sit down and, and, and talk to you. And I want to welcome uh, Chief Master Sergeant Karen Byrne Flint. Thank you, Chief. The honor is all mine. Yeah, no, welcome. Welcome to the show. Um, so tell us about your journey. Uh, you, you, you ended up leaving Bloomingdale, New Jersey. You joined the United States Air Force. Uh, what, what drew you to the Air Force? Well, sir, it's it's a pretty long journey because I left Bloomingdale, New Jersey, and went to college. Uh, so I did two years at the Roger Williams University up in Rhode Island. Uh, after about my second year, I met my first spouse, uh, mm -hmm. and then I decided we were going to get married, and he went into the Air Force, so I was a dependent spouse okay. living in Tampa, Florida with our son, thinking that life was good, um, and I didn't know anything about the military, didn't understand why they played the music at the end of the day, didn't had no idea about the culture. Um, we lived off base, so I didn't go on base very often. It only took him about two years to realize he wasn't a good fit for the Air Force, and so they asked him to leave. He was a firefighter. Mm -hmm. um, and during that time, it, w it was a shock to the family. Uh, we didn't have income. I was working part-time as a manager of a pizza hut. And oh. uh, when he was asked to leave, uh, I had to work full-time, which is about 60 hours a, a week. Mm -hmm. uh, with one day off, it was a Tuesday. That was not sad. And at, so, at Pizza Hut? Pizza Hut. Okay. Yes, sir. And so one day I was sitting down with his supervisor, uh, Tech Sergeant uh, Roy Calvin, and he said, you should join the Air Force. And I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> Do I look Air Force? <laughs> He's like, no, serious. Because <laughs> when, when we moved down there um, to, to Tampa, I did go back to school. I was trying to finish my bachelor's degree. And uh, when he was asked to leave, we lost everything, so I had to stop. And so I was devastated and I was depressed. And he said, you know, you should really consider joining the military because I think you would do well. And at the time, I didn't believe him. Um, and I tried to figure it out on our own. Things weren't working out. Um, got very desperate. You know, you hit, you hit a low place. Went to the state of Florida for help because we had a hard time putting food on the table. And they said I needed to quit my job. And mm -hmm. they would put us on state assistance. And that was not something I wanted to do. So then I went to the recruiter. And I joined the Air Force. Yeah. And uh, landed at Grand Forks, North Dakota. Yeah. But I first ran it through my my brother because my brother is already in the army. Mm. And if anybody in the world knew who I was, he knew who I was. Mm. So I, you know, I called him up and I'm like, "What do you think about this?" And he said, "Well, don't want you in the army because he was in infantry. He was actually um, working toward being an 82nd Airborne Ranger is what he wanted to do." Uh, he said, "Nope, don't join the army." You don't need to be in the Navy. No, nah, Marines, you probably can't handle it. The Air Force is probably where you need to be. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, well, hey, man, I, I think we, <laughs> we lucked out. I'll I tell you what I really like about your story. It's not that much different from mine and, and many other uh, airmen like, like us um, who we didn't grow up thinking, hey, I want to join the Air Force and, and serve my country or, you know, defend the, the, the universe. But uh, somehow the universe grabbed us and, yeah. and brought us here. And, and uh, like many of our airmen, you've had a very, very successful career. Now, I know you're OSI and you have a badge and you have a gun. But if you call me sir again, I'm going to have to have you arrested. So you got to call me Kay Wright the rest of this interview. Yes, Kay Wright. All right. There we go. <laughs> Um, now what, what, what drew you to, uh, so, so after you came in and, uh, a little bit of humble, humble beginnings, what, what made you want to be an OSI agent? Again, not something I was planning on doing. Um, coming into the Air Force saved my life. So when I, you know, it didn't take me very long. My life had a couple of bumps in it. And, um, what I learned early on was it wasn't necessarily the job that was, that I was there for, it was the people. Mm -hmm. um, because no matter where I went, no matter what I did, the people to my left, to my right, and people above me and below me were always there to help. So, um, you know, I spent five years at Grand Forks. I ended up getting a divorce, and then I ended up getting remarried to mm -hmm. my current husband, who was also an airman. And uh, we, we traveled the world a little bit. We were both uh, information managers at the time. It's admin now. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up in Alaska. 
And while I was in Alaska, I got an opportunity to be a PME instructor. So I got to teach Airman Leadership School for four years. While I was there, um, I finished up my education, and I made tech. I was about nine years in, and they came back. The career field came back and said, you can't come back to the three alpha career field. We're overmanned, so mm-hmm. you need to cross-train or get out. And I had just finished my master's degree, and I was going to then decide. I decided I was going to separate and try to get my Ph.D. in forensic psychology. Meanwhile, there was an agent who would come into the classroom and talk to all the students, every Mm -hmm. class. And so, you know, we started chit-chatting and he was like, well, you're like, you know, my undergraduate is in psychology and I really am fascinated by why people do what they do, which made my fascinating leadership also part of my journey. And so, you know, he said, well, have you thought about OSI? And I said, why, no, I have not. And so he brought me over, and I sat down, and we talked, and I looked at what they did, and it terrified me. Mm. I never saw myself in law enforcement or working counterintelligence investigations or doing anything with a gun and a badge. And so uh, after long talks with my husband, and because it is a family decision, it's mm-hmm. not something you can decide to do by yourself, um, it terrified me. So I said, you know what? let's try it and if it works it works if it doesn't then I can get out and be a dependent wife (laughs) so it was hard oh yeah and and it seemed to work out pretty well you made it it all the way to 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 the top so how how was that how was that being uh, the senior enlisted uh you know advisor to the the general that's in charge of uh you know all of air force osi I mean what's that experience like what's your day-to-day uh look like it's inspiring uh, and it's challenging. Day to day, it's just a matter of like where we are. We travel uh, a lot. Mm-hmm. We're at 260 locations worldwide, so we try. I try to go out and see as many of our airmen as I can in a year, um, and just find out. You know, if my job is to advise him on what's going on with his force, then that's where I need to be because mm-hmm. uh, it's very hard to understand what they're up against because they're not in front of me every single day. Mm-hmm. So I find myself needing to get out and talk uh, and finding out what what can we do to help them get that job done. They do phenomenal work. They inspire me. You know, you give an airman, you know, the opportunity and they'll amaze you every single time. And so just to watch them um, get the mission done, you know, save lives, make our Air Force stronger Mm -hmm. is inspirational. But then it's challenging because there's a lot of hard things that we see and do every single day. Yeah. And, uh, it adds up and it, and it starts to wear on them. And, and I struggle with how, you know, what can I do to make them healthy, to keep them vital and, and, and vigilant and strong and resilient? Yeah. And so. So, you know, we'll we'll come back to that because I want to I really am interested in, you know, I know as as agents, you guys get to see kind of the worst that our Air Force has to offer sometimes. So we'll come back to, to resilience. But hey, to, to anybody listening, you uh, you know, make a case, and I know uh, I'm not sure if you guys have a, a, a recruiting, um, you know, program. But but to anybody listening that that might uh, be thinking about it or may have never heard about it, kind of kind of kind of like you, you know, make the case for why would anyone want to be an Air Force OSI agent? I mean, what's the well, if you're looking to, I mean, the biggest thing is speaking for those that can't speak for themselves. Mm. I'm being the voice of 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 people that have been harmed, uh, and then protecting that family. Um, so we, I see us, we, we do two things. We, we protect the Air Force from the threat outside, mm-hmm. and then, of course, we protect the Air Force from the threat within, whether that's criminal or, you know, somebody's trying to do bad things to the Air Force from within. Yeah. Um, and so we're here to find the truth uh, and to preserve justice. And, and if you are looking to make a difference and and speak for those children, men, and women that can't speak for themselves, Mm -hmm. uh, and to protect um, the nation against those those entities uh, that want to hurt us, this is where you should be. Yeah. Now, is is OSI different, fundamentally different from NCIS uh, or or the Army CID? Fundamentally, we are very much aligned like NCIS. A CID is, it is a little bit different. They train different. They're organized differently. Um, CID is a law enforcement arm, Mm -hmm. and NCIS and OSI are law enforcement and counterintelligence. Okay. 
<coughs> excuse me, the biggest difference between the two of us is um, NCIS is their agent corps is strictly civilian. Okay. And in the Air Force, we are active duty and civilian. Mm -hmm. So um, that makes OSI uniquely different than any other law enforcement agency out there because we have both authorities, counterintelligence, and law enforcement with the active duty and then civilian components together gives us capability around the world. Yeah. And and your agents are federal federal agents, right? Could yes, you go sir. to the FLETC, the Federal Law Enforcement Training, training Center, Center. Yes. Uh, down down in Georgia. So yeah, it's a it's a it's a good deal. Yep. Nineteen weeks. Um, ninety seven other law enforcement agencies go through the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Um, mm -hmm. so CID does not, but mm -hmm. NCIS does. And then, of course, we have a follow-on course for OSI specifically. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I've had the opportunity to work with um, not just you and, and some of your your predecessors, uh, but chiefs and and just agents, you know, for a, a better part of my my career. And like you mentioned earlier, they see a lot, they go through a lot. It's a tough, tough uh, business. Um, how do what do you recommend to them as you go out and you travel? You know. Um, all over the the world to 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 see how they're doing. You know what what is it that you think uh, they can do to remain resilient to be able to you know continue on after um, you know doing the nation's nation's hard work. Yes, that is something that I have been very um, aggressive with since I've been the command chief. And you know we we have our you know a few of the values that we have within OSI is is you know to take risk. Mm -hmm. and to hunt, to be proactive in what we do. And I use that because it's not just agents in OSI. We have all different types of airmen in OSI. And so when we say hunting, it's just going after, being proactive about whatever it is in front of you. Um, and in order to do that, you need to trust. Um, so I'm trying to take that operational mindset and make it operational in our resiliency. Because if we're going to be hunting our enemies, we should be hunting our resiliency too. Mm -hmm. And this is no doubt that coming in and doing and seeing the things that we see every single day. And it may not even be horrible things. It may just been, you know, you've been running, you know, sex assault investigations for the last two years, and that really wears you down. Mm. Uh, and you start seeing things and, and, and documenting things and, and testifying to things that most people don't ever have to deal with. And whether they're in a deployed location or they're sitting in, in state signs someplace doing some of the criminal investigations, it's still it's a hard on them. And so they should be proactive about that. There's nothing normal about what they're seeing. No. And so the response to that it shouldn't be average either. Like mm -hmm. you need to be asking for help. You need to be going out and talking to somebody about the things that you see and the things that you do uh, and, and not just carry that with you because it's going to catch up because there's a price that we pay when we take, you know, when we're running these cases. And yeah. so I don't want them paying the price when they retire. Mm -hmm. They come in excited and energized and, and ready to change the world. And some takes... 10 years, some takes five years, some takes two years. Heck, it could take six months before you start breaking down. And then now you're going to leave broken and carrying a lot of baggage with you that they're, you know, the, we didn't ask you to carry it. Yeah. Well, you needed to pick it up, but you can put it down mm -hmm. and teaching them how to put that down sooner rather than later. Yeah. So when they do retire, they can do whatever they want. They're fully resilient and healthy. They came in the same way they're going out. That's that's where I want to get them. And, and breaking that stigma of, I can't ask for help, which is, you know, that's a stigma in the Air Force. That's a stigma in law enforcement across mm -hmm. across the, the world um, is, is that we got to be tough. Mm -hmm. We're the people that protect. We can't we can never ask for help. And that is absolutely wrong. Yeah. And so we're trying to really break that down and, and create that, you know, and we even um, General Bullard and and I had come up with um, based on uh, General Goldfein's resiliency tactical pause and, and your resiliency mm -hmm. tactical pause. We took that a step further and. We created an opportunity where um, we expect them to take that weapon system down because our airmen are the weapon system um, that we use to keep the Air Force agile. Yeah. And so just like any other weapon system, you know, we take care of it. Well, mm -hmm. are we taking care of us the same way we're taking care of our aircraft? Yeah. You know, how, how, how have you done it? Right? You've I been in it? this. You've been in this business a long time, and and you've been an agent for for a long time. I mean, how how do you stay uh, resilient? How do you you keep your sanity through it all? So, uh, well, I I work out a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, I learned that uh, before I even came into OSI that um, my my stress relief is is 
exercise. And so I make that a priority. Um, a lot of times the first thing that goes in OSI, because you get in and you get busy, is your is your personal care, mm -hmm. physically working out. You know, we don't have time for it. Well, you have to make time for it. So I do. I make sure that, you know, I get up early. Um, I usually get by 4 or 4.15 in the morning, and that's the first thing I do is I work out, and then I eat well. And I get, of course, being up at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm usually in bed by 8. So um, I make sure I try to get my sleep. Uh, and then... Um, I have my I have my family support structure around mm -hmm. me. Um, I have four adult children. I have beautiful grandchildren, um, and then of course I have those that I can talk to because sometimes it can't be the family that I talk to. Yeah. You know? So I have I have people that I I'm able to reach out to when I feel like I'm I'm starting to slide. Yeah, man, I really admire you for being able to get into bed at eight o'clock. Only time I'm in bed at eight o'clock is if I'm sick and I can't. And I'm about to die. It doesn't always happen, but it's, <laughs> if I'm not in bed at 8 o'clock, I'm usually falling asleep wherever I'm at at 8 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, what about, uh, have you had a, a a mentor throughout your career? Did you how, how, did you uh, lean on anyone to help you throughout the... I've had several. Growing up in the Air Force? Yeah, yeah. I've, had, I've had a few at different stages uh, of my life. Uh, early on, I had someone that... that uh, help me see past myself mm -hmm. um, and, and work toward, you know, not to be intimidated by people around me and that I, I was worth it, which at the, when I first came in the Air Force, I didn't think I would deserve to be here. And so I, I had a mentor that kind of stayed with me for a while and, and helped me um, help build confidence in myself. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I was a PME instructor, um, it, that my mentor there happened to be the flight chief uh, for the Army Leadership School, and, and then he just taught me how to lead um, and, and not to lower my standards. And then, of course, in OSI, I've had several mentors, but one in particular that I've, I've had since he was my chief since the day I came into OSI, and, and he's always just kept it real. And so mm -hmm. that's really, I tried to keep it real and be present. Yeah, keep it real. What, what is that when, when people, because I, I hear people say it all the time, what does that mean? What does that mean to you when you say somebody keeps it real? S so he tells me how it is. Yeah. Like when I ask him a question, he doesn't sugarcoat it. it. You know, whether, you know, why didn't I make the cut for that course or, you know, how come I didn't get to go, you know, on that TDY? Mm -hmm. He tells me. And, okay. and he's never just sugarcoated it. He just said, here's how it works. And yeah. he gave me the bigger picture. He always explained the why, mm -hmm. which is very important to me. I always need to understand, you know, why things are happening and the way they happen. I, I just don't want to stay in my little silo. I want to see, you know, how does the bigger picture operate and how do I fit into that bigger picture? Mm -hmm. And he, not even knowing that that's what I needed, this individual was able to share those, those pieces with me that now made me understand I'm just a small piece of this big organization and that there's a lot more going on here than I see. Yeah. So clearly, you know, you've had several mentors and this, and it's been an important part of your career. What would you say to the young men and women, whether they're uh, OSI agents or, or just airmen out in the air force who, who say, you know, mentorship has kind of become a buzzword and, and I'm not sure if it's really a thing or, you know, how do I go about, I'm a little bit uncertain about how to find a mentor. What, what advice would you have for a young person that's um, up and coming and they may be struggling or they may just be aspiring to be the next, you know, Chief Byrne Flint? You know, what's, <laughs> what advice would you give them in terms of finding a mentor? So be, mentoring is very, is very personal. Like mm -hmm. when I made... Uh, chief, I had someone come up to me and say, I'm going to be your mentor. Mm. And uh, that was not going to work. because <laughs> yeah, was like, that's not how this works. And I don't like you. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so I, you know, in my experience, mentoring is, is very personal. And so we can try to programmatic, pro programmatically enforce that. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to be, a re it's a relationship. And so I absolutely believe we need mentors, maybe not the same one through our entire career. But someone that, that can inspire you, uh, that will tell you um, what you need to hear, even if you don't want to hear it, and you need to trust that person. And it's, it, that's what, that the, the foundation of everything is that trust. And so, uh, you know, you may, you may think it's a buzzword, um, but it's definitely, you know, when you find that person that you can trust and you know that no matter what you're doing, he'll either call your bluff or, you know, have you, you know help you strive to get to that next level, that's that's earth shattering. I mean, that's really, it can change your life. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I would say go for it. And, and, and if you're having a hard time, you know, just start talking to someone. Okay, good. That's great advice. Um, you know, one of the things that we like to do on the show is we like to take questions from sometimes we get them from the, the internet's, 
from uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and other places. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Harry Kibbe, uh, the producer and extraordinaire of this show. And uh, he you. has a few questions from, from the audience. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief Byrne Flint, today our questions come from Twitter. Um, people submitted questions by messaging us at SimpSaf18. We picked the top questions, and here they are. Um, Phil Bass noticed your outstanding Airman of the Year um, devices on, on, we put your bio picture yes, up there sir. on Twitter. And uh, he'd like to know how can we help airmen um, reach their full potential and possibly uh, follow in those footsteps? So I would say, you know, a, a lot of times in, in, you know, as growing up as airmen, we're always looking to the next best thing. Like what's coming after this? You know, we get to an assignment, we're in a job. Well, what do I need to do to get to the next job? And we forget that we need to focus on what's in front of us today and to master what we have in front of us today. And I can tell you, you know, those two of them I, I earned when I was um, under the Allied Command Europe, under NATO, and I had, n n like, I wasn't looking forward. I was looking to make my local, my current location better mm -hmm. and how to do that and, and to be involved. And so I didn't, I wasn't looking for the next best thing. I was just trying to be the best airman I could for the organization that I was in. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for two years in a row, and, and that's how I got the first two. And this, the third one was um, when I was a PME instructor. And again, it wasn't looking forward. I was just owning what I had in front of me. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, 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 I, and I loved my job. Mm -hmm. I loved taking care of airmen. I loved making a difference. And I wasn't looking to the next stripe. I wasn't looking to the next job. Um, I wasn't looking to the future. I was just trying to own the mm -hmm. present and making what I was doing currently the most important thing. So like Chief says, bloom where you're planted and pursue excellence every day. Absolutely. You, okay. Um, thank you very much, Chief. AFSA Chapter 211 wants to know, what do you think is the most underrated leadership skill? Underrated leadership skill. Well... I don't know if it would be a skill. Um, I, I recently read an article on accountability. And I think as leaders, whether you're a young leader, like as, as an NCO or, you know, a, a new captain or you're a chief or a colonel or, you know, GO, uh, accountability is really important. But there's a lot of courage that goes into being accountable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like sometimes we um, are afraid – to, to tell people what they need to hear and that we're afraid to hold people accountable, whether it's because we don't want to stir the pot or this is a good airman, I don't want to ruin their career or everybody likes that airman and I don't want to be the bad guy um, or, or trying to change a culture in a unit that is toxic and being the person to stand up and saying this is not satis you know, this is unsat mm -hmm. and these, these airmen deserve better. Um, it's, it's our responsibility as leaders to have that courage to stand up to ensure that those situations are being corrected because that's that's what our jobs are. Mm -hmm. And so while it may not be a skill, I think to have the courage to hold people accountable and to give that feedback is very important. Okay. Um, that was for AFSA Chapter 211. And this one comes from Christina, who asks um, if you could share with us who is someone who has inspired you and why? Present company excluded. <laughs> Harry inspires everybody. Yes. <laughs> so um, I would have to take this home and say my parents. Uh, my mom and dad have worked very hard their entire lives. And if it wasn't for them and them teaching me how to, to put my heart and soul into everything I do uh, and to be honest and, and not take no for an answer, um, I, I don't know if I would have gotten even remotely as far as I ever have. Um, so, I mean, my dad and, and my mom, my dad retired from the telephone company. My mom is still a nurse. Uh, and uh, they're very passionate and, and dedicated, not just to their work, but to their family. And they, should, they taught me how to, how to do it all. And, and that's where I started. And every single day, you know, I talk to my parents t two or three times a week, every single week, and they keep me grounded. Uh, and that's, they're my pride and joy. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, and thank you to those who submitted the questions. As always, you can reach us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Back to you, Chief. Right. All right. Thanks. 
Hey, what what uh what gets you out of the bed in the morning? What what inspires you? Well, <clears throat> a lot of things get me out of the bed in the morning. The alarm <laughs> clock. <laughs> um, seeing what I can do to make to make the world a better place for our right. airmen. Yeah. Um, the job isn't done. Uh, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night because I didn't get something to where I needed it to be. Um, I didn't, I mean, didn't, you know, the changes that I'm trying to make aren't happening fast enough. Um, so I know when I wake up, I have a whole day to c- continue to work at it and continue to try to make, just make us stronger Air Force. Um, and, and I have, you know, my, you know, my, my organization is, is where I'm starting from. But I know that as, as I work for them, they're working for the Air Force and, and together we're creating a much better team. Yeah. You know, the, the, the kind of opposite part of that question that I always ask is then what keeps you up at night, right? What, what about the air force or the world kind of concerns you and, and, uh, you know, has you, has you thinking the most? Like the opposite, the resiliency of my airmen. Mm -hmm. Um, because I don't know if I'm making changes fast enough. I'm trying to change a culture and that's one of the hardest things you can change in an organization. And, and sometimes I feel like maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I'm not saying enough. Um, and, and that keeps me up. Yeah. Because they're, they're going to go out there and they're going to do exactly what we need them to do, um, regardless of where they're at in their resiliency. And they deserve. Yeah. They deserve better. You know, it's been a, it's been a couple of years since I had an opportunity to visit your, your headquarters and, and personally thank not all, but, you know, uh, some of some of your – your agents for what they do. And, but I think they should know how much we as airmen appreciate, uh, what they do for all of us, you know, protecting us from, from without and, and from, from within. Uh, I know it's very, very important work. Most people get nervous when they hear OSI cause they, they think they're <laughs> in trouble and, and you may be, but, <laughs> um, we, we really do. I, I want to pass along my thanks, uh, not only to you and General Bullard and, and all of the leadership, but uh, all of your agents and all of the support staffs uh, of uh, OSI all across the, the globe that that uh, help protect us and keep us safe. So I just want to, you know, say that and I want to say thank you, man, for well, we appreciate taking care that. of us. Thank you. We appreciate yeah. that. Um, what are you reading these days? So I'm reading a lot of stuff. <laughs> I had to write them all down because I tend to forget all the titles or the names. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I spend a lot of days, as you do, I'm sure, reading emails mm-hmm. and documents. And, and so I have to kind of split it up. I do a lot of podcasts. Okay. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And then I also listen to auto, audio books yeah. because I spend a lot of time in D.C. traffic. Mm-hmm. So I'm usually able to to listen to more books than I am actually to read. Okay. Um, so um, I'm currently reading um, Switch. Yeah. It's by Chip and Don Heath. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about change. Um, I, I, again, um, being in this organization and trying to institute some of the changes is huge culturally. And so how, how to best go after that. I just reread, at least for the third time, uh, Start With Why mm-hmm. by Simon Sinek. Uh, and then I've also read, um, I'm also in the middle of reading uh, The Infinity Game, which I think is you, you announced a few months ago. And so I picked that one up. I love Simon Sinek. Oh, so. yeah. So that's a good one. Okay, good, good. Any, uh, and you said this is your first yes, my podcast first that podcast you've actually ever. Okay, no, you'd be able to listen to yourself on as you're sitting in DC traffic. That's great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. What about any hobbies? What do you do? You know, you work hard. Uh, you got a very important job. You know, lots of tough things happening in the world that you have to pay attention to. On top of being the chief and and all the other things that come along with, and pressures that come along with being a chief. Um, what What about any any hobbies? I am fortunate enough to have a phenomenal husband who is now a retired airman mm-hmm. uh, and four adult children, and I have three grandchildren Ooh. with one on the way, so that'll be four. Um, I do have one that actually lives with us, and and so that, to me, going home and being able to see my granddaughter yeah. is, is a gift. So we babysit on the weekend, mm-hmm. and so that's my hobby. Okay. That's what I do. When I'm not traveling, I am home hanging out with my granddaughter. So you look about 27 and... 32. The, okay, 32, 32, right? So the question is, what do your grandbabies call you? Are you a nana, 
Oh, G Ma. Close. What? I wanted Aunt Karen, but my children absolutely <laughs> refused. <laughs> absolutely refused. So they call me Nana. Nana. Okay. Yes. You don't look like a Nana, but we'll. we'll, we'll I, I, we'll I couldn't that. do Grandma. I yeah. couldn't do Grandma. Besides that, to my mom. <laughs> okay. So it couldn't be the same. So I, I'm Nana. Okay. Yeah, or my it. my oldest grandchild calls me Nan. Mm-hmm. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, Karen, I, again, I just want to say thank you. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention is that you're also a member of the AFSELC, the Air Force Senior Enlisted Leader Council, which is the group of senior uh, chief master sergeants and other senior enlisted leaders that um, allow me to to do my job as a chief master sergeant in the Air Force and provide me the right advice and guidance. And you've been there the whole way. Uh, you know, helping us as we make decisions about about the Air Force. And so I want to uh, say thank you, uh, not just for what you do as the uh, senior enlisted leader for uh, OSI, but uh, as a member of, you know, my my inner circle that, that helps helps me make decisions about the Air Force. So um, anything else you want to say uh, before before we roll out today? Well, I want to say thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. Um, I, when I got the the request, I thought it was a mistake. <laughs> I was like, the, you sure you got the right burn flint? <laughs> but Harriet, I want to say thank you. Um, the work that you're doing um, for your airmen is phenomenal um, mm-hmm. and that we, we are benefiting every day from the great leadership that you've provided us. And it is, it's an honor to serve with you uh, and to be here to, to take this opportunity to sit down and talk with you. Yeah, yeah. It sounds corny and I always say it, but man, teamwork makes the dream work. And I Absolutely. and I love having a, a great team of uh, folks around me. So uh, thank you. Uh, before we go, let me just take a minute to thank a few people. First, of course, uh, our guest for today, uh, Chief Karen Byrne Flint, the uh, command chief for our Air Force OSI. Thanks to everyone who submitted questions over the internets. And uh, special thanks to the team who makes this happen, our, our lead technical producer, and that's Staff, Staff Sergeant Kat Walters, and the three amigos, John, Juan, and Tony. And, of course, uh, my big-headed PA advisor, Senior Master Sergeant Harry Kippy. Uh, lastly, thank you to the current and future leaders out there who are on the front lines leading your teams. This has been your Blueprint Leadership Podcast. Thanks for listening. If better is possible, good is never enough, and you are your greatest competition. 